Good morning. Happy Easter, everybody. This is the day that we celebrate our Savior's resurrection. We celebrate what he's done for us and who he is. So I invite you to stand to your feet as we sing. Angel told the women, don't be afraid, because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. On the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, tremble death, where is your steed?
that's in the blood this future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ has won so I can face tomorrow for tomorrow's in your hands all I need you will provide just like you No matter what comes my way, I will overcome. Don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. I'm fighting a battle you've already won. on Jesus Christ and I'll say that it is well oh, I sing it as a church I know how the story ends we will be with you again you're my savior my defense no more fear in
before we turn and greet one another, I would, uh, encourage you guys to scoot in to make room for those that might be coming in a little bit late. But let's say hello to somebody new around you. Good morning and happy Easter. My name is Sarah, and today's scripture reading is from Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning, 
and his clothing was white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. The angel told the women, do not be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here for he has risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. So, departing quickly from the tomb, with fear and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the news. Just then, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. They came up, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus told them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. As they were on their way, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders and agreed on a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money and told them, Say this, his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were sleeping. If this reaches the governor's ears, we will deal with him and keep you out of trouble. They took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been spreading among the Jewish people to this day. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped. But some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Jonathan. I'm one of the pastors here. And it's good to be with you on Easter. I want to I want to follow with Nathan's tradition of saying, not Nathan's tradition, but as Nathan mentioned for us this morning, of saying, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, as I was getting ready for this sermon this week, there's a lot of things as you're preparing for Easter, a lot of tradition, just like the thing that we just we just said. And I'm talking to my five-year-old in the car, and I'm asking him what he's looking forward to about this week. And he mentions Easter. I'm like, oh, great, great opportunity. I'm going to ask him. What do you know what the meaning, the purpose of Easter is? Why do we celebrate? Why do we have a party around Easter? He says, oh, I know why. And then doesn't say anything. So I kind of wait a minute. Okay, okay tell me. So, so why? And he says, well, it's all about the empty eggs. <laughs> oh, boy. Parenting fail, right? Right there. I mean, it's not about empty eggs. It's about eggs full of candy, of course. I mean, it's what I needed to instruct him in. Well, All of you who've ever tried to communicate deep truths about Easter or holidays to little children know it can be hard to explain what is going on and trying to help us understand it, especially to something like a five-year-old. So I would ask you, what would you say when a five-year-old turns to you and says, what is the meaning of Easter? Or maybe, maybe phrase it for you this way. What do you see when you look at the empty tomb? What do you see when you look at the empty tomb? I think the answer to this question gets at the answer of like, why are we here? Now, perhaps you'd say, well, well, pastor, of course I'm here. My my wife made me come. Or student ministries had a volunteer holiday. Or I always come to church. Or if I'm really honest, those donuts are pretty good. Well, I ask this question about why are you here or what do you see? You look at the empty tomb because I think the answer to this question is the most important question you're going to answer. For over 2,000 years, the church has gathered, not just on Easter, but on every Sunday, to celebrate the resurrection, to celebrate what we are celebrating today because what we see when we look at the empty tomb really matters. Now, for some, the empty tomb is a harmless story or harmless myth, kind of like the Easter bunny. For others, it was a deliberate attempt to deceive, 
you to use deceit to hide the truth and to deceive millions over thousands of years. But for some of us, it's the most important story in existence. It's a true story. It's the day that we look at the tomb and we say the tomb is empty because he is risen. That's a really bold claim. That the tomb is empty because he is risen. Do we really believe that? Do you really believe that? So I want to turn us back to you and say, what do you see when you look at the empty tomb? Our goal this morning is to answer that question, and to that we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the story that we just had read. We're going to ask why does it matter, and we're going to say, what should we do? We're going to look at the story, we're going to ask why it matters, and we're going to say, what should we do? So if you're willing, turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at that story again of Matthew chapter 28, the story of resurrection. Starting in verse 1. It says, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning. This is important to note, even at the beginning, that it's the uh, beginning of the Sabbath, that this is a, a Sunday. You see, Christ died on a Friday, and su- Sabbath for the Jews was Friday night to Saturday night, and they're not allowed to do any work or to touch any dead bodies. So Jesus has died. He's died on the cross. They had to hastily, quickly give him a burial. But they weren't able to do it the way that they maybe would want to, to really care for him. So they hastily put him in there, and they haven't been able to see him now. So they've waited, and now it is Sunday morning. The light is coming up. It's beginning, the the, the day is beginning, and they're on their way to the tomb. It's Mary Magdalene and the other Mary who went to view the tomb. So who are these characters? Mary Magdalene uh, was a follower of Jesus, who'd been following Jesus from the beginning, The scripture talks about how she supported Jesus out of of ministry. So she worked and followed alongside and helped support the work that Jesus was doing. Her name is mentioned more times in the Gospels than any of the disciples. So very prominent follower. She's the first one to see that is here on the resurrection. So that's part of her. Then they mention the other Mary. Who's who's the other Mary? What happens to be Mary, the, the, the mother of Jesus? You know, also a pretty significant figure. Now, it's easy to go through this part of the story. Like, okay, so we have these two Marys who are rushing to the tomb. But let's, let's even pause for a moment. They've been following Jesus for years. But if you're the, for Mary, the mother of Jesus, I mean, you've, you've known he was important. You knew he was the son of God. You knew he was going to be the Messiah, but you didn't know how this was all going to work. But just a few days ago, people were saying Hosanna. People were excited for him to be king. They were excited for him to be the Messiah, the one to come rescue him. It seemed like everything was going this way, where it was like they were, he was going to rescue them. And then it just changed so sudden. Now this is a mother who is grieving the loss of her son, who thinks, who knows, who is seen, who was there at the foot of the cross as he died. And I'm sure the, the, the mixture of emotions and wondering what is going on and walking to this tomb and walking with another close friend is they're on their way. And you even wonder where, where, are, the, where are the disciples, where are, the, where are the, the men in the picture? But no, it's these two women who are coming up to see Jesus. I wonder what is going through their minds in this moment. Well, as they were, went there, it says they went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him they became like dead men. So we enter in our third character into the story. These women are walking to the tomb and as they're on their way, we see that there's the angel of the Lord. He descends from heaven. He causes an earthquake. He approaches the tomb. He rolls back a stone and he sits on it. I'm sorry, it's just the stage of life I'm in, but I just imagine like a little toddler doing something impressive and then sitting on top of it and kind of like, look what I did. But I don't think that's probably the attitude of the angel, but there he is. He's done all this work. In fact, I know that's not the attitude of the angel because when you look and you see what's going on, you see that the guards are terrified of him. But why do we have an angel in this story? What's going on in this moment? Couldn't, I remember reading this as a younger kid and thinking, well, did the angel have to let Jesus out of the tomb? You have to roll it away? But no, no, no. Jesus didn't need the angel to let him out. The angel's rolling away the tomb so that we could see in. So that we could see that it was empty. Jesus was no longer there, but we couldn't get there without having the the, the stone rolled away. So there's the angel, and the angel has terrified the soldiers, 
And these are not people who get easily scared. These are people who expected there to be trouble. They expected somebody to maybe come and try and steal the body. They've been posted as a guard to guard against it. And they're so terrified, they're not moving. They're acting like dead men. Let's keep reading verse 5. So the angel told the woman, don't be afraid. Because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. This moment is kind of important to say that he is not here. And of course, you say, well, of course it's important. But even as they're thinking through their heads, can you imagine just the shock of what they're trying to comprehend as the angel says, Jesus, the one who was crucified, yes, he is dead. He was buried here, kind of confirming, yep, Jesus was here, but he is not here anymore. And of course, the first things that are going through their head, well, what? What What do you mean he's not here? Who took his body? What did they do to him now? Can't they just leave his body alone? I just wanted to come and help get him ready for for burial. He was buried so quickly. Can you imagine the shock, the sadness, the anger? But then the angel continues to talk. He says, he's not here for he has risen. All right, hold on a second. What do you mean risen? Like risen from the dead? That's... That's not possible. I'm sure at this point they have seen Princess Bride and they have talked to Miracle Max. And they know there's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. And if he's mostly dead, well, he's still slightly alive. But if he's all dead, all you can do is check his pockets and look for loose change. Right? They know dead people don't come back to life. Right? We add a little bit of humor to it. But those who are dead do not come back to life. What do you mean he is risen? Right? They're, not, they're not comprehending this in this moment as they're looking at it. But then the angel says something else that's important here. He is not here. He is risen just as he said. This should not be new information, but it felt like new information. Jesus did exactly what he said he was going to do. All throughout his earthly ministry, he's been trying to help people see that, yes, he is the Messiah. Yes, they were right to shout Hosanna. But their expectations of a Messiah and a Savior and what he was supposed to do is very different than what he actually did. Remember when he gave stories and examples of this where he would say, if you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it. He was talking about his his body. You destroy my body in three days, I will raise from the dead. So this is what he's been saying he would do all along. Why have they not remembered? I think it's because they still were expecting a different type of Messiah. They were expecting the conquering king, not the suffering servant. They wanted him to overthrow the Roman Empire and save them from their earthly captives. They weren't thinking big enough. Jesus knew their greatest needs, that they were separated from God that they needed to be saved from sin and from death. I'm going to love to show a picture of this next part of the tomb. It says, the angel says to them, come and see. And we're not sure this is the tomb, but this was right next to the city limits. I had the opportunity to visit this when I was in high school. It was certainly a tomb like this one. And I put it up there because I love this next moment. The angel isn't, well, how come you didn't remember? And how come you didn't have this? There's this very gentle and soft invitation. Come and see. The angel could have said so many other things. Here's the invitation. I know this is hard. I know this is a shock. You came to see the dead body to get it ready. The body is not here. Jesus is alive. Come and see the empty tomb. Then let's look what they do in verse 7. Then after they came and see, go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. The angel says, after you come and see the empty tomb, go and tell others. Go tell the disciples. I even love this moment that it's the, the women of the story who are going to tell the disciples that Jesus is not dead. The tomb is empty He is alive with a promise that they will see the resurrected Jesus and to head to Galilee. And so they would start to go. 
Keep reading verse 8. They depart quickly from the tomb. There's a little bit of fear and there's great joy. And they ran to tell the disciples the news. I love that little tidbit of they ran. All right, at this point, Mary's probably close to 50. We don't know about the age of Mary Magdalene, but they're just, they're running. They're going. And as they're running to tell the disciples with great joy, Jesus met them. And he said, greetings or be glad. And they came up to him. They took hold of his feet and they worshiped him. Even this moment to see him, to come up to him, to grab hold of his feet. It was common in the Greco-Roman world that you would, when people would be traveling, that you would wash their feet. They've hosted and cared for Jesus many times. These are probably feet, strange as it sounds, they would recognize. But the last time that maybe they washed or cared for these feet, there weren't holes there weren't scars, but they take hold of him. He's real. He's tangible. He's there. He looks at them. Verse 10, Jesus says to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. So the women came. They took hold of him. They worshiped him. The idea of worship is something that you don't do for a man. This is something you do for God. They realize in this space, fully man, fully God, they are worshiping him as Savior. And then they went to go and to tell others. Part of the beautiful story. It doesn't end quite there. Let's keep reading. Verse 11, it says, as they were on their way. So as, as the women are going to tell the disciples, some of the guards came into the city and they reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. And the chief priests assembled the elders and agreed on a plan, and they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. So the guards are like, okay, what do we do? They've just seen this. They've been terrified. They run into the city to tell the chief priests what had happened. But this is a bad moment for them. Because if they did not do their job, if the body is missing, if they did not guard the body, their lives are on the line. They will be killed. And so as they start to, start to tell them what's going on, the elders agree, we cannot let this be true. <laughs> We cannot let Jesus be risen from the dead. So the facts are in front of them, but there's a willful heart moment of we're not going to accept this. They had to give them a large sum of money because for the soldiers to admit that they fell asleep would be a space again. They could be killed. But who, what else are they going to say? I mean, even in this moment, well, an angel came. Well, okay, people aren't going to believe us that an angel came, that we were the body was stolen. So they kind of hedge their bets and say, this must be our best case. We'll take the money. We'll tell the story. So that's what they do. And that is the story that has been told, and that is still being told today, that the guards took the bride. All right, there's a lot to this story. It's one we've heard before. Let me ask us now, now that we've got a chance to read through it, why does it matter? Why does this story matter? And in particular, let me ask you again, what do you see when you look at the empty tomb? Because seeing the empty tomb, there's a couple things it does for us, but seeing the empty tomb, the first thing is that it validates the claims of Jesus. It validates the claims of Jesus. Something happened 2,000 years ago that the world cannot explain. Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be both God and man. He claimed to have the power to forgive sins and to restore the broken relationships that we have so that we could have a relationship again with God. He claims that whoever believes in him would not die, but would have eternal life. Today, there's many people who would like to dismiss the person of Jesus or dismiss the message of Jesus because maybe they don't like the church or they don't like organized religion. And they say, oh, well, we like the person of Jesus, but we just don't like the church. But if you think about what the person of Jesus said, you have to deal with his claims. The person of Jesus made some audacious and bold claims. He claimed to be God. C.S. Lewis was a Christian philosopher who was an atheist until he examined the empty tomb. And then he kind of summarized by saying it this way, that Jesus was either a pathological and narcissistic liar, somebody who knew that he wasn't God but claimed to be God because he loved the attention, or he was a crazy lunatic who actually thought he was God but was a normal man, just like us, or he was, in fact, God incarnate, worthy of worship and being called Lord. So to summarize, 
Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Those are the three options. You can't like the person of Jesus and not deal with what he is claiming to be. As followers of Jesus, we believe that he is Lord. And if this isn't true, then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul talks about this. And he says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if he isn't actually God, then we are to be pitied because we are fools. In fact, tonight we should go out and eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow, tomorrow we die and this world feels worthless. What are we doing wasting our lives following this Jesus if he didn't rise from the dead? This changes everything. When we look at the empty tomb, we have to deal with the fact that it is empty. We cannot remain neutral. I believe that it validates the claims of Jesus. Looking at the empty tomb validates the claims of Jesus. I think looking at the empty tomb also meets some of our deepest longings and needs. Seeing the empty tomb meets our deepest longings. What I mean by that is the question that lies beneath for, so many, for all of us is that we, are we really loved? We're created for relationship. We're created to belong. Each of us has that longing to be loved. And when we look at the empty tomb and when you see that, I hope that one of the things you see is that you are loved. Not just humanity broadly, you are loved. The empty tomb is the greatest encounter of love that we can imagine. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The cross is the moment where Jesus shed his blood for us, for our sins. The empty tomb is where he shows that he has defeated sin, he has defeated death, and that he has done it for you. So not only does this moment of the empty tomb scream that we are loved, it also is a moment that screams that sin is defeated, which is really good news, both personally and corporately. I think broadly, it's easy to look around and notice that things are not the way they are supposed to be in this world. Right? We see it, but when Christ died for the sins, he also rose from the dead. He is showing us that he has defeated the power of sin. Sin no longer has to rule and reign over this world or us. And when you start to think about that individually, that's like, well, that's complicated because if sin doesn't rule, then how come I still act the way this way or that? What it says, we're in our, we're in our Romans sermon series. And next week, regardless of what you believe about Jesus, we have, we have things in our lives that we wish weren't there and things that we wish that we did not do. And sometimes we feel enslaved to those things. Paul, the, the writer of Romans, knows what that feels like. And join us next week as we talk further about what does it mean to have the power of sin defeated on the cross. Now, not only are we loved, not only is sin defeated, but I, death is defeated. This is one of my, this is my favorites, because last time I checked, we all die. But death does not have to have the final word. And I need to remember that. This is true not only for us, as we look at ourselves and as we sort of say, wow, just, things have not gone the way I thought they would go. My body is getting older. Things are not working the way that, that I want it to work. I mean, this is also true for those that we love, someone who's close to you. Perhaps this is one of your first Easter's without somebody that you love and you've lost them. I know this is true for our church. I know this is true in our church family. We've had far too many funerals. I'm thinking of one specifically it was in late January that we lost Kathy Kaler. And as we wrestled with that funeral and we were talking and I was talking to David, David shared with us something that I need to remember, that heaven is real, that death does not have the final word, that death is defeated. And his community group made this for him to put in his garden that's coming up as you see new life springing up from the ground around him. Heaven is real. The resurrection is real. This is where our hope is. For those that we love, that we will see them again. For ourselves, that one day we will die, but yet we will rise again. A physical resurrection. If you need to, go and read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that talks about this physical resurrection, but it's real. I need to hear it. We need to hear it. Rising again from the dead, Jesus has defeated death. It does not have the final word. So seeing the empty tomb meets some of our deepest longings. It validates the claims of Jesus. 
Lastly, seeing the empty tomb transforms our daily life. It has something for the here and the now also. You see, the one with authority over life and death has the authority to speak into our lives. To say it in another way, the one who came alive out of the grave has, has the ability to say how we should live. He gets to tell us what to do. And a lifestyle of following him in obedience and apprenticeship to Jesus is the only viable option. Let me read the end of Matthew as it starts to tell us the final words of Jesus as he's talking to his disciples, Matthew 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says this. Jesus came near to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus gave his disciples, this is how you were meant to live your life. After my resurrection, this is what I have for you to do. You are to go and to make disciples. Which if you follow our church, this is our church mission statement. We exist to be a caring family of multiplying disciples, influencing our community and world for Jesus Christ. We don't get to set our church's mission statement. Jesus actually did that. We just repeat what he has said, and we're trying to be good stewards of what he's asked for us to do. But sometimes I think we tend to think of like, oh, we'll make disciples. That means there's, there's this, this piece to it that's evangelism, but it's actually all of our life. Look as he's talking about it. He says, go. The idea is like, as you were going, what you were doing, we were to make disciples, which is, yes, helping people come to know Jesus, know this good news, the power of the resurrection. He says, baptizing them. So we're going to have a baptism service in two weeks. And if that's something that you have never experienced and you've never been baptized, we would love the opportunity to baptize you where you acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if that's something you have been baptized, we'd love to invite you to come and celebrate with those who are proclaiming it to be true. So there's this aspect of baptizing. There's also this aspect of teaching. How we make disciples? By baptizing and teaching. And this teaching is not just a lecture. It's not just a sermon. Or it's not just public proclamation. It's the idea of observing. It is obeying. It is in all of life. I am learning what does it mean to model my life as a follower of Christ. This is modeling behavior. And all of this is possible because notice what Jesus says at the end. I am with you. I am with you to the end of the age. Don't miss that aspect of it. God, who's died on the cross and rose again from the dead, is with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. We get to be with him because he loves us. Because he wants to have a relationship with us. We've looked at the story. We've remembered of why does this matter. Because it validates the claims of Jesus. It meets our deepest longings. It transforms our daily life. I'd love to end our time together by saying, so what do we do? What's some of the tangible nuggets you'd have for us? What do we do? I'm going to go back to that first question. What do you see when you look at the tomb? If you're here this morning and the claims of Jesus about him having raised from the dead, you're a little skeptical of them, what I want to tell you is find out. Do homework. Dig into this. You cannot remain neutral to the resurrection of Jesus. You have to deal with the empty tomb. You have to decide that he was a liar, that he was a lunatic, that he was a Lord, that he is Lord. You can't just say he was a good teacher. Bring your doubts. Bring them. Doubt is not the opposite of faith, right? What is the opposite of faith is willful disbelief. It's what we saw when we saw the Pharisees who had facts come to them, and they said, but I can't do that. I'm going to create a different narrative. I'm going to create my own truth, my own story, because I can't deal with the truth. Bring your doubts. I think as you bring them, you will, you will realize the claims of Jesus. Some helpful resources for you as you want to dig into that. There's A Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, a helpful book if you're interested in reading it. Also, if you go to our website, there is a blog that you can listen to, that you can read, or a podcast that you can listen to with Craig Blomberg, who's a New Testament scholar, who deals with how do we know? What are the facts of history? How do we see this in Scripture? Bring your doubts. You have to deal with them. You cannot remain neutral. I would also push you again to say, if if it might not be an intellectual issue, often what I find for people is it is a heart issue. It is that moment of, this is not something I want to believe. I don't want it to be true. And my hope is that as you look this morning and you see the empty tomb, you realize God's great love for you. 
And after encountering the truth, you will choose to believe. If you've never believed before, I'd have love to have a conversation with you afterwards, but it's very simple. It is called the ABCs. We acknowledge our sin, that we can't get to God on our own. We believe in Jesus, trusting him as our savior, and we confess that he is Lord. Some simple steps for what does it mean to believe. Now, for those of you who might be in the room and say, I am a follower of Jesus. I believe in the power of the resurrection. I would still ask you the same question of what do you see when you look at the empty tomb? If seeing the empty tomb needs to transform your life, then maybe there's a call to action of diving in deeper to this great commission that we're called to be disciples that make disciples, uh, that we're meant to be a caring family of multiplying disciples. Maybe you need to lean greater into the commission that God has given for us. For me, personally, the one that hits home the most is the the satisfying the deepest longings. I need to remember when I look at the empty tomb that I'm loved, that sin is defeated, and that death is defeated. I think many of you know some of my own story. I lost my mom when I was 11, and every Easter, the church I was at would give out an Easter lily. And they gave that lily as a reminder that that death is defeated, that Christ has won, and here is new life. I would always take one home, and I buy one every year now, just to remind myself of the hope of the resurrection. So when I see that tomb, I'm reminded, death does not win. It does not have the final word. Maybe there's something you can do to remind yourself of that empty tomb today and to celebrate that Christ has won. The last thing I'd love for you to remember is that he is with you. Heaven is real. Heaven is real. He has saved us. Death is defeated. I am loved. May that hope resonate deep with you. When you look at the empty tomb, would you remember the love of God that he has for you? Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you. We thank you today that death is defeated, that we are loved, that you have won. Lord, we thank you that you have validated your claims. God, there might be some in this room today that have never believed that or never held on to that or they've had questions. Lord, I just pray that as they wrestle, would you reveal truth to them? Would you reveal yourself to them? Would they look and find you? God, for others of us in this room, Lord, as we may struggle to hold on to that and to remember it's real, can we look to the tomb to see your great love for us? So, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. One of the things we do every week and that I love is we partake of communion together as a way of remembering his great love for us. If you're new with us, there's going to be stations all throughout the room, several in the front, several in the back. We're going to gather in groups of five, six, or seven. We're not in a hurry. Take your time. Sit and reflect before you come up. But we want to provide a space for you to remember God's great love. And even as you come forward, our hope and prayer is that in a tangible way, you would physically Notice and taste and see that God is good and that he is for you and that he loves you and that he has defeated sin and death. And so it was, just a few days before his resurrection on the night he was betrayed, that Jesus took the bread and said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In a similar way, he took the cup said, this cup is the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. I invite you, when you are ready, to come forward.
invite you to stand with us and let's pray the Lord's Prayer together this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began, Ash was redeemed. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. Orphan heart was given in vain. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. All right, let's lift it up, church. Oh, your grace, so. Washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arrives and I read in the air. That's when death was arrested and my life began. That's when death was arrested. That's when death was arrested. Oh 
did in my life be All right, it's time for our benediction. Do we have Nikki? Here we go. Good morning, everyone. It really was a joy uh, just to all be together um, and celebrate. And we pray that as you leave, you do so, just finding joy um, in Easter. Um, He is risen. He's risen indeed. That's right. Um, It just changes everything, doesn't it? If you don't have a church home, we would love to have you come back here and join us. Um, Next week, we're going to be back in our sermon series in Romans, where we will see that God doesn't just save us from our sins, but he saves us for life with him, both now and forever. And if you don't have uh, one of our Form Life journals, um, there's a new one out there on the tables as you exit, so be sure to grab this. It's a devotional, and it will start tomorrow. Well, now, as we go from being the church gathered together to being the church scattered throughout our communities, bringing the good news of Easter with us, um, we have come to our time of benediction. And we have a tradition here at Christ Community that during our benediction, our good word for the road, we extend a hand. And this is just simply a way to show with our bodies that we receive these words. So if you feel comfortable, would you extend your hand? Hear these words of Jesus. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go in peace.